And when you understand that your child is not a bad child and you're not a bad parent and we lose these labels and we move to a place of agreement, mm -hmm. huge things are possible. Hey you guys, Irene Lyon here and welcome to this video and the chat that you are about to listen to with my colleague and mentor, Steve Terrell. Now Steve, he'll introduce himself in the video, but to give you a little bit of background, he primarily works with children and infants, teenagers and their parents, helping them when they have been through all the professionals, all of the professional helpers, psychiatrists, psychologists, specialists, because of behavioral issues, because of concentration problems, ADD, violent acting out, behaviors that aren't deemed appropriate for our civilized society. And um, we really dive into the question of safety. What is it, what does it mean for a child, a human being, to have good, safe nervous system regulation on board? why that gets thrown off and some of the beginning steps that we need to take to start to bring this idea of good nervous system health back into really harmony. Um, of course, this is a massive topic. Our talk is not super long, but hopefully it provides a little spark into you so that if you are struggling with your own children or maybe you were that kid that struggled when you were really young, this will give you a little bit of meaning. It'll make a little bit of sense. This is also for the parents who feel like they've totally screwed up their kids because they now realize that their own personal trauma, their past transgenerational trauma, how they were when they were carrying, say, maybe baby, they were stressed, conditions weren't the best. Um, Steve has a really important note at the end of this video for all of those parents who might be in that boat. So take some time, grab a cup of tea, grab some water, grab some wine, um, whatever you like to do, and listen to this master talk about his work and really what we need to do to help our children be healthy. Enjoy. One final note before you dive in. I wanted to put this in before rather than after, just in case there's a bit of confusion. Now, Steve and I could have talked for 10 hours. And of course, he has a time limit. I do as well. So this is like a beginning entree into this concept of working with nervous system stress physiology, stress neurochemistry, learning how to help a child, a teenager, an infant, even an adult, get back to self-regulation of the nervous system. If you're new to me, if you're new to Steve, check out our work via our sites, check out my stuff via my site, get some more answers on board, ask some more questions. This is, like I said, just the beginning and there is no way in this small interview that we can give you an entire plate of solutions and exercises and tips and tricks, but this is really just to get the conversation started so that you can start to understand why some of these more severe and even subtle behavioral issues occur in children and even into adulthood. Take very good care. Enjoy. Hey, Steve. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. So I am, first of all, so grateful that you're here talking to me and my people who are watching this um, all Thank over you. the world. And out of curiosity, where are you in the world geographically right now? Geographically, today I am in Pflugerville, Texas, which is just north of Austin. It's one of the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And I'm in my home office uh, where I do consults all day on Mondays. All so day on Mondays. <laughs> this is where I am. That's your, that's your throne for the day. This, this is it. <laughs> and then you also have obviously an office where you see... Yes. Clients. Yes, my office is in Austin. Cool. So can you give our viewers, the people watching this, like what is your, I know you because you're one of my teachers, you're one of my colleagues, met you uh, actually in, it would have been in Corte Madera, California, seems like ages a ago. A long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and for those of you that don't know Steve, um, he often when I talk, 
to my people and in my vlogs, I mention a woman by the name of Kathy Kane. And Steve here and Kathy, you guys co-teach, right? Yes. Yes, how, we do. How did you meet, actually? I'm curious. I met Kathy when I was doing my somatic experiencing training many years ago, it seems like now. Uh, she was doing the advanced level, mm -hmm. and I met her at advanced. Uh, I liked what she was doing. I wasn't sure, but I liked what she was saying, and I thought, this is this person is different and she's coming from a different perspective than I'm used to. Yeah. And so immediately, like two weeks after I finished, I was uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, mm -hmm. taking her touch skills class in the, the very first, I mean, immediately I was there. You were boom. I was boom. And I went through that and changed me, changed my perspective on clients and how I work and, uh, has made my life a whole lot better. The program we teach together is the Somatic Resilience Program, Regulation and Resilience. And that happened because she had approached me about teaching a children's program. Oh. But at that time, there weren't enough students for just the children. So we decided to do an adult-based and a children's-based combination. Got it. So that's how that came that's, together. And then that's where we met originally was was for that one. So, but you weren't always someone that works because you primarily work with kids. Right. I started, um, I worked with a very specific population. The population that I ended up was foster care mm -hmm. and adoptions. Mm -hmm. Foster care first. Um, as a play therapist, I was a registered play therapist. I did basic play therapy. I took TheraPlay training and did TheraPlay. Um, so I was combining those in my practice. And then a shift happened and I started working more in adoptions. Mm. Um, from the foster care world, moved over to adoptions. Um, we started working with a lot of Eastern European mm. adoptions coming out of Kazakhstan and Russia. Mm. Um, some very complicated cases started coming my way. And uh, so I did, uh, I belong to Attach, which is for adoptions. That's kind of professionals uh, organization and family organization. I worked through them and just really learned uh, basically um, an interactive therapy, dyadic developmental psychotherapy, which mm -hmm. was developed by Daniel Hughes. And I started using that with kids and talking more and moving more. And still there was something not quite getting to where I wanted to get to. Right. And I came out of a, an older thought, which goes back to, there used to be a practice called holding. Okay. Never, heard, never, never heard of books that. Written, and there's been books written on it, and it was very, it was very abusive in my opinion. Hmm. Um, if it wasn't done really, really well with a parent, and there was a lot of complications with that. So I was looking for another sort of regulation because that's what it was actually doing. It was meant to bring on auto regulation, co regulation, um, teaching the child how to feel more of a safety feeling with the therapist or the parent mm -hmm. and then I discovered touch hmm. and working through touch and understanding the process of touch and it is so much better <laughs> so much better yes so just to go back holding is that like when you say it to me I think of like literally holding it is, is that except you would hold them in a position like they would lay in your lap and you oh. would hold them and they would become almost violent. They could become very angry, very, and you would regulate them all the way through until they were able to calm back down. Wow. It was a very, uh. very challenging process. And at the time, huh. it had results and it still has results with certain populations, but uh, it is it is a lot of hard work and it's it's not i don't recommend it mm. it's a very challenging and difficult process to do mm. um i'm much more pro understanding how to bring about regulation in your child uh without such severe antics and that the process of healing to in my opinion is much more of a gradual process with a lot of subtleties happen and those subtle changes i find last 
for decades where the big fast changes seem to have rebound effect and the child returns right back to the earlier behavior rather quickly. That's actually, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's this thought in our culture, not just with working with children, but anyone, big mm -hmm. people, that we need to figure it out <clears throat> fast and soon, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we can have more ease, a better quality of life. And it can be really tricky sometimes when you say to someone, this could take a few years. And it's like, oh, that's a long time. It's like, it is, but in this grand scheme of the rest of that child's life, if we think about children who you, mm -hmm. who you pretty much exclusively work with, a few, mm -hmm. a few years is not that long. It isn't at all. And when you realize, when you see and you understand the way I look at it is that this child has been out of regulation some since before they were born. Yeah. They come to see me. So once they're to bring them into regulation, if they're already five, six, seven, eight, or nine, or 12, or 20, or 30, or 40, there's a lot of years of dysregulation, and they've developed a lot of management techniques. Mm -hmm. And those management techniques are what is how people get labeled with different diagnoses, how kids especially. Yes. And then there are a lot of medications are happening, yes. and a lot of things are happening that are adverse to them getting better. So the process does take a while. Understanding that these came out of a high sympathetic arousal, a high fear response mm -hmm. initially. So that's going to complicate it even more because what happens when you go in fear again? Yeah. You look for the same pattern. So I want to go back because we know what regulation and sympathetic arousal mm -hmm. means. There might be someone that doesn't. Um, right. If you could break that down in basic terms, when a little one, let's just say, we'll use a hypothetical, comes to see you, a, a, okay. a, a child, what's usually going on? Like what's the more classic scenario in terms of their system, their physiology, their nervous system? Good question, Irene, because most of the kids who come to see me, I'm very rarely ever their first therapist. Right. They've already been to multiple therapists. They've been to multiple types of psychologists. They've been to a lot of different venues before they get to me. So when they get to me, um, it's almost always some behavior that's interfering with their activities of daily living. Right. Um, whether that behavior is they can't get out of bed, they're throwing things, they're hoarding food, mm. um, they're not able to sit in their seats at school, they're um, sexually acting out, they're emotionally uh, short-fused, uh, their parents can't take them out, they yeah. can't go to, to the movies, they can't sit through a movie, a lot of them. Uh, or they're just nothing. They're not reaching out. They're not enjoying life. They're just kind of flatlined. And uh, usually it's, it's, almost, it's always behavioral. It's something that the parents can't tolerate. Exactly. Is why they're coming in. It's, you know, they're tolerating it. They figured out a way to tolerate it. Mm -hmm. but, but parents haven't figured out mm -hmm. that, how to tolerate it. So it's because of, you know, some sort of rupture with the parents that they come to see me. I see. And when they come in, is it often, and correct me here if I'm wrong, are the parents like, we have to change this behavior? Is that, because they, and I only know this from hearing other family friends, will, they'll go and they'll say, oh, they've got this behavior that's not proper, we can't, we can't take them out, just like you said. How can we fix that behavior? It's always fixed the behavior. Is it actually the behavior? Now we'll go back to that nervous system regulation thing. Explain the mm -hmm. difference between trying to teach a child a better behavior versus getting under the rug into the root of why that is there to begin with. Well, one of the things that, that I notice is because I specialize in developmental trauma, something has occurred, there's been a rupture in the child's life, either during utero or 
within the first few years of life. Either it could be a medical intervention, mm-hmm. or it could be abuse, or it could be adoption, separation. Yep. There's something. So that we're looking, I look at, okay, the most of the kids I see have never been regulated. They've never, and by regulation I'm talking about, the easiest way is yeah. look at a river. Okay. Look at a river and think of a river, stand on a bridge looking at a river, uh-huh. and the water is all one color except for in the middle. Right. Okay. In the middle of the river, there's a dark stream that runs through it. Uh-huh. That dark stream is regulation. Okay. The outer parts of the river where the water is, is more rapid than hitting the walls rocks. or the edges of the rivers or the rocks, that's the dysregulation. Got it. And over here, there's this whole area where it's like backflow, where the water isn't moving at all, uh-huh. and that's more of a, a hypo response to the sympathetic. It's so. it's going down into the the lower part of um, I'm not moving as fast, I don't feel as much. That's the child who walks outside at 40 below zero, and they don't have a coat on. They don't feel the cold. They're not noticing. They're wow. you know, completely unaware of their environment. And uh, so looking at it, I want to bring kids back into that stream mm-hmm. or that window. We can look at a window and call it a window of tolerance yes. where we get alerts, and then we go back down, and that's sympathetic and parasympathetic arousal. It goes up with the sympathetic, down with the parasympathetic when everything's okay, and there's little bursts of those. And we get them all the time. Everybody gets them. Yeah, of course. It's whether or not they're within that regulatory space. Right. Yes, in that window of tolerance or in that dark part of the river that's running through. And that they can come back. So there can be, you know, stressors in the day, which everyone... You know, before we got on, yes. the, before we got on the call, I was telling Steve about some ants that are in my bathroom last night. That got me a little aroused. I'm on the edges, but then I brought myself back into the middle. Right? Yes, you knew how to do that, but yeah. a child, a child might use behavior. Okay. And they're going to push that down. If you think about an arm board that rises up. Mm-hmm. And this spring is up in the air and it's outside the window or that space of regulation. They stack stuff on top of that to push it back down and hold it down. They want to hold it down because if they can hold it down, then nobody's going to notice and they're not going to have those same sensations, which don't feel good. Yes. And so that's behavior. They're using management (laughs) skills, which is normally biting, kicking, screaming, fighting. And they're using those to push them down. And it's hard for parents because, you know, one of the things we're talking about what parents complain about, I get to complain a lot of times. I don't understand. Little Susie or little Mark, I worked with them on Thursday night. They knew all of their vocabulary words. They could spell them. They could write them. They knew the meanings. And they go to school on Friday morning and they fail the test. Yeah. The parents are like, how does that happen? Yeah. And they're so angry about it when they yeah. come to see me. And I have to explain, you know, when that arm is coming up, mm. they're not safe. They're feeling a, any sort of safety issue. And it's rising that the IQ begins to drop. Yeah. And that uh, the, the memory, that cognitive memory of pulling out vocabulary words loses to survival. Yeah. I have to survive. Something yeah. is going to eat me alive if I'm not completely alert and paying attention to survival. So mm-hmm. this part over here that says, oh, yeah, I can spell, goes, Poosh, No, I can't. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Okay. So I want to, this is really good. This is important. We know this information, obviously. Yes. You just said a few keywords, safety. Yes. So I'm going to paint a scenario. So say you have someone who is adopted yes. and or a person's own child in their house. It's safe. There's food, there's shelter. Mom and dad are not, you know, abusive in, in any way. And what would, why is that safety still, or that unsafety, I should say, in that person's system when there's actually safety around? That's a, you know, I mean, when we think about safety, Mm -hmm. 
we have a you're thinking as an adult yes thank you thank a you. child safety is a whole lot different if i've been separated at birth or if i'm adopted there used to be a belief and there's still a belief that love this thing called love conquers it all really conquers all it does not no thank it you it does help you have strength sometimes mm -hmm. to deal with someone but it doesn't conquer it and with these kids when they're looking for and oftentimes they misinterpret and they believe that the earlier experiences were love so when you show them love it scares them they actually have a reaction to it and the sympathetic arousal will begin because they go into a fear response and they want to unconsciously, it's almost like they're setting you up hmm. to replicate the earlier behavior. Oh. So it gets really out of sorts. And if a home is truly safe and it's a biological child and it's been safe since birth, unless there's been a lot of medical interventions, there shouldn't be a big di dysregulation issue occurring. Exactly. They should be feeling safe. So there's the next question or the next piece. So uh, there's two pieces to that because um, we've been mentioning adoption, children that were literally taken away from their biological right. mothers in probably unsafe circumstances like in Eastern Europe, like you said. Um, and then you just mentioned children that are with their parents biologically. One of the situations where this might occur is if there was medical trauma. Right. Um, I just want to put a, touch, a little piece on that because this is often a question that is not asked to parents when their child's misbehaving and they never connect it to the dentist. The Any words no. to mom and dads listening to this around that and how important because people will say, oh, well, they're fine now. They they had the, the filling in look. They're, but... but but what goes on yeah. in a little person when they are put under these medical procedures, whether they're old enough to remember it or not old enough to remember it? It doesn't matter if they're old enough or not. The body remembers it. Okay. And the body's going to hold that memory. The body doesn't ever forget. It holds on to everything that's ever occurred. And so if the body's remembering it, you know, that child's going to have a reaction to it, yeah. um, especially you know babies that are in NICUs. Those babies that have three or four months or three or four weeks in a NICU of separation, we see even greater. I teach parents. I say, think that you are NCIS, and you'd have to be American Television to know NCIS. What's CIS? But it's, uh, <laughs> It's a forensic show. Okay, okay. Where they're looking for forensics of who, you know, who did what crime. And parents have to be forensic. Uh -huh. And they only, you know, when you come to see me, it's a big forensic. I'm doing a forensic map. I'm saying what happened and when did this happen and what happened at birth, what happened at conception, what happened. I want to know everything possible. Mm -hmm. I want to know everything. Mm -hmm. and you have to be forensic, and then you start putting the pieces together, and you go, oh, okay. So if Susie is putting a turkey under her bed at night and <laughs> hiding food and hoarding this food, and the parents say, why is she doing this? We have food in the refrigerator. Why is this happening? And then we go back, and we say, oh, yeah, well, she wasn't able to eat. She wasn't able to latch right off at the bat. And then she wasn't able to eat. She had severe reflux for a week or two. Right. That's enough. Uh, that right there is enough. To, to that cause a child that. Can't, it'll throw their eating habits off. They won't want to eat. Or they'll want to hide food. They're going back and forth. We see all sort of eating behaviors mm. start happening. Which is a big concern with parents. Wow. So even if the trauma wasn't like food related, it could be being in an incubator, maybe some feeding tubes where they were getting nourishment, but it wasn't, yes. it wasn't this organic, I'm hungry, where's mom's boob or where's the bottle? Right. It, it was very disturbed. 
And it's not coming through the oral if it's a feeding tube. You know, oftentimes feeding tubes are coming the other direction. Exactly. So it's not exactly not going to have the same effect. But it, the, the long-term effects can be pretty devastating on a kid. Got it. And that kind of early trauma, let's say they don't have an eating disorder later in life, um, mm -hmm. could also come out as what we would call classic anxiety Oh, yeah. Yes. Definitely anxiety is... A, the big one. It's a big one because everybody uses it for management. It's our go-to. We immediately go to anxiety because that, you know, that in itself, we see it as, oh, it, I can't go outside because I'm so anxious or I can't go to the mall because I'm so anxious. And we see this as such a negative. Yeah. But the positive to anxiety yeah. is, that's right, you can't go out. You're going to stay inside your house where you can be safe, safe and you can let your nervous system begin to regulate and we can start working on other techniques to where and figuring out what's, what is that fear, mm -hmm. what's causing this to occur and let's get some regulation on board mm -hmm. which will expand your ability to even think mm -hmm. and let's work on it from this angle. Good. Okay, so that different way of looking. it is a very different way of looking, seeing that 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 response, that arousal, that anxiety is there for a reason. Yes, it's not about how do we get rid of it, because that's right. often what the case is. Whether a person is an adult or a child, let's medicate it, let's breathe deep, let's meditate. Well, and I tell parents, you know, I say when they come in and they'll say, Susie or Billy or whoever lies to me all the time they lie all the time mm -hmm. and i like i go you know that's going to be the last thing to go away yeah we don't fix symptoms i want them to keep lying because that's keeping them safe right now while i while i do the job of starting this child on a road to regulation Listen. as i teach you how to help regulate when you're not in the office and we see this child in a more safe haven a safer environment mm -hmm. then then and only then and it's going to take a while yes will the lying go away because we, we won't need it exactly because it's a more cognitive higher brain thing so is it true then that the more higher brain thought out things that kids are doing will be the last to go because it's almost always always okay good to know always so for everyone watching we're going to get into ways that you can start to help your kids but i want to touch on one more thing and okay. it's it's the, again the child that didn't have the adoption didn't have the surgeries all those things and yet there's still this this anxiety this dysregulation and the reason i want to bring this up is because i get a lot of emails cuz i work with big people with adults mm -hmm. whom often have children who are mm -hmm. often full grown or somewhere in the childhood scene mm -hmm. and their words to me for lack of a better way of putting it are I've totally mucked up my children yes you I, did and I and yeah and they feel like failures yes they do how come no one ever told us this mm -hmm. are they doomed mm -hmm. um, blah 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 and I can't imagine how awful that must feel but well, it is awful because you're 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 right there. You're saying to me, you're saying, "Oh, but you figured it out." Exactly. You figured it out. We're not hopeless. No, we're not helpless. You got to my office and you figured out whether what you did wrong. We're going to work on you too. Almost all the parents of of kids and yeah. you know any adults I work with uh, the, even though there's not as many number wise they all you know we're working on regulation mm -hmm. and what I want to know is what's triggering them I want them to make a list I want to have this information coming from them and that we work together as a team to change what some epigenetics not just this generation it's multiple generations yeah because we are raised by who we raise and we act and raise like the person who raised us exactly so that whole circle of life keeps getting us and you know it takes a lot of work 
It's, it's a, a big commitment. It is a commitment. And the reason I wanted to bring that up, and maybe I didn't mention it for those listening, is that if we've given our children everything they need, we've even loved them and, and held them and nursed them. And then there's this thing of, well, what? There's still, there's still this, the child still feels unsafe. They're still acting out. They're still colicky, all these things. And that your trauma, the adult's trauma, even if it's not in our conscious awareness, correct me if I'm wrong here, will somehow via osmosis, we know this because of the vagal, vagus nerve, right? it will transfer, even if we're doing all the right things, correct? Without a doubt. Okay. Without a doubt. <sighs> Crazy, isn't it? It's a good crazy, though, because yes. we now know how to change. Yep. And that's the good part. Cool. Doesn't mean that 100% you're going to be perfect. Nope. But, you know, if you hit 70% of the time, we're, your whole life and your child's life is going to be a whole lot better. Cool. So what's your advice, Steve? I know that before we started chatting and recording, you told me about what you're starting to work on. Because mm -hmm. you're in a situation where you are full with your practice. So mm -hmm. do not email Steve. Well, go, go to his website to get on his email list, which is about to come up. Yes. Um, but you're wanting to create something for parents. Tell us about that. Okay. Um, my website's www.austinattach.com. Mm -hmm. In case people are looking for me that way. But what I'm looking to create is a training program where parents can fly in or I'll go to California or to Canada or wherever I'm going or in Japan mm -hmm. and we'll work with parents directly, not professionals. This would be a parent training to work on some very specific things in regulation through touch the parent can do with the child where the parent can come in and understand if I just touch my child's feet mm -hmm. they're going to be, and I'm calm, mm -hmm. my child's going to begin to become calm. Um, so that's something that's coming. It's in the awesome. on the horizon. Uh, that kind of program. I work with parents a lot. Hot water bottles. Mm. The old kind of hot water bottles, the rubber ones. Yeah. Not too hot, but warm. Mm -hmm. Putting them under a child's kidneys at night, under their back, putting them kind of in that V where there's one under both kidneys. Yeah. You know, buy two of them. Put the child yep. right in the middle begins the process of their kidneys and their adrenals regulating down, understanding that the adrenals are so powerful mm -hmm. in our arousal states. That's mm -hmm. where you know a lot of cortisol, those things yep. are coming from. So we want them to relax. Yes. Teaching parents how to do that. Teaching them how to use weighted blankets. Mm -hmm. this, is to, be this has become a trend recently. I keep seeing more of it. So... There's lots of places online that tell you how to make them, and they're a whole lot cheaper to make than they are to buy. Yeah. Um, so there's those, you know, teaching parents the importance because kids who aren't regulated, it feels really good to be under a weighted blanket yeah. and calming them down, teaching parents how to turn the lights down mm -hmm. before bed mm -hmm. in the house, turning off the television, turning mm -hmm. off the cell phone, mm -hmm. sitting with the child next to you on the couch and saying, okay, turning the lights down, we're getting close to bedtime because there's so many issues around sleep. Yes, there are. It's very fearful. So we start slowing things down. But doing that in the family living area, mm -hmm. which makes the house safer, mm -hmm. and then go into the bedroom to read the story and making it quieter. But we want to make the house safe. That is such an important distinction. Oh, showing Hope. kids that you lock the doors at night. So many people lock their doors after their children are in bed. Uh -huh. Do it before your children are in bed. Uh -huh. So they see things such as Santa Claus coming, the Easter bunny, all of these things that we have, these visitors, are hmm. very scary for a child who's been adopted or separated. Mm -hmm. Very scary for a lot of kids who's had a lot of medical trauma because it's like I'm going to be taken away. A stranger. A Stranger, teaching parents how to put things, gift, gifts on the porch or in the garage, have them arrive there. So we're going to leave the garage door up. They can put you in the garage and then we'll bring them into the house if they're wow. coming from a stranger. The Easter basket can be 
mm. outside and brought in and being able to teach parents that those are scary scary things that somebody's coming down your chimney that's not a good thing <laughs> no, it's not not a good thing for a child who's been abused interesting you know, this this is another strange person a strange man coming into the house at night doesn't mm. matter that he's bringing gifts with, yeah especially if there's been any sorts of abuse because an abusive child oftentimes are given gifts not to talk. Right. Right. So we have all of these little quandaries here. So, you know, with the population I work in, mm -hmm. I really want safety. I want your house to be safe. I want your windows locked. I want your doors locked mm -hmm. where your child sees that you're doing everything possible. Got it. That to be safe. That is, thank you for adding that in. I never even thought of that. That has never come up in our trainings, actually. But I think of, you know, the bedtime is such a stressful time, even in the in a good situation. <laughs> and right. it, often it's forced, like it's about going into their bedroom, being in the bedroom, but it isn't about that entire environment of the space. So, no. so there could be mom, you know, another parent that's off working, doing lots of high arousal stuff in another room. And another parent is trying to get that baby to sleep or that child to sleep. And that's why it's not working. Not working. They both need to quiet down at least 20 to 30 minutes before the child's going to bed and have that. That way, the living room, the bedroom is not a separate part of the house. It flows into the living area, flows into the hallways, flows into where the parents are, and everybody's going to feel better mm. with that time to just go into even meditation, you know, quieting down for a few minutes. Yep. Some easy music, that kind of thing. Easy music. Cool. Well, that is a gem. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everything I will link below, your site. Um, I'll also link some stuff on adrenals because you mentioned it for those who may not know sure. what that is. So I'll put that below this in the YouTube video. Um, okay. And what would be some final words that you'd love to offer? to parents who are feeling like they've just completely mucked it up from your heart, from your own. Well, from my, you know, of course I'm a single dad with two boys mm -hmm. and I have uh, made more than my share of error mm -hmm. um, over the years. And what it's so easy when you understand what's really going on with a child when you have the full picture, when you have the whole blueprint, mm -hmm. and it's not just, okay, we're over here talking about this or that or trying to figure it out, but have the whole holistic piece come together. And when you understand that your child is not a bad child and you're not a bad parent and we lose these labels and we move to a place of agreement, mm -hmm. huge things are possible, huge. Just takes time. Thank you. Thank you.